Good day, everybody. My name is Diana Lucien, founder of Diana Entertainment. Welcome to this plenary of Oceans and Renewable Energy. To start, a much deserving thanks to the founder of Morassus, Dr. Frank Jurgen Richter, for putting up with my crazy ideas and innovation, and to my extraordinary partner in crime, Marian Azan, who founded Alpha Institute. To this colorful characters on this plenary, I'm deeply honored that we have to be one legendary Christian goddess, Dr. Sylvia Earl, and four young Medina who admire her incomparable path. Coincidence? I couldn't say. Dr. Sylvia Earl is the founder of Mission Blue, a founding of the Elder, a National Geographic Explorer and Resident. She has an astounding 33 honorary degrees, countless awards, and has authored more than 150 publications. Not only is she a true scientist, explorer, and conservationist, but I quickly realized that she's an incredibly lovely human being. From deep sea robotics to hope spots around the globe, Dr. Earl has created a footprint that is unimaginable to most human beings, Dr. Earl and Arnold. And to the fearless avant-garde gentlemen, we have Ibrahim Al Hussein, founder of Youth Cycle. Thank you for immediately understanding. Raising my seemingly unfeelable movements, <laughs> global appreciation and altruism, your genuine and active support in the world. Crystal Barnes, co founder of Blue Moon Foundation, which has helped protect 5 million square kilometers of ocean, and grateful for our good friend Jimmy for providing our world. Moving on to our 21st century swashbuckler. David Mayer Rothschild, founder of Wilson Nature Foundation. David, thank you for your instant warmth and grasp on the urgency of a much needed collective action. Next, an international Hall of Fame photographer, filmmaker, and scientist, our moderator, Paul Nickling, is the co founder of Sea Legacy, along with a very special guest appearance by the multi talented and lovely Christina Mitchell. This dynamic duo clocked around the earth, capturing breathtaking stories and saving our lives. On that being note, Paul, there is the way. Thank you very much, Guy. I, I really appreciate this. You know, I uh, right now, Christine and I are stuck in a campground in Saskatoon, <laughs> Saskatchewan, living in a camper. It's freezing outside. Um, it is such a privilege to be here with all of you, and and I think that. You know, often we do a lot of these panels, all of us do. Um, and often when I get home, I, I'm always like, I wish I could have said this, 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 this. So this panel is going to be pretty loose. I know David's already warmed up. Ibrahim and I've already, been, we've already been talking and he has lots to say. Christina has lots to say. Sylvia is a wordsmith goddess among every other thing. She's a good friend of mine. We've worked together at National Geographic for many years. You know, I, you know, my, the original question is, it's basically, a, you know, how this pandemic has afforded us nothing but time to reflect and sit at home and stare out the window. And I think that you'll all agree with me that it's been absolutely overwhelming with Zoom calls and, and, you know, direct messages and texting and that we haven't, we haven't had a moment, you know, so I just, I'm going to change and shift things a little bit. Um, and let's just get right to it. You know, it, the ocean is, in my mind, and maybe someone here disagrees, but the ocean is the most important ecosystem on the planet. Uh, Sylvia, you say it better than anybody. So I just, I just want to ask this question to everybody, and we'll go down the line. Um, but why do you think SDG 14 is the most underfunded, the Sustainable Goal 14? Why are the oceans the most underfunded? And Ibrahim, can we start with you? You're the first on my screen. So it's, it's a great question. Maybe um, we can all just share a little bit about how we got into this work. And it's interesting because the genesis of, uh, of me going from being a senior serial entrepreneur to a general technology investor to a climate investor really has to do with my life underwater as well. You know, I grew up on the Red Sea. And I would scuba dive, my family had a home on the Red Sea, so we'd scuba dive every weekend in the same spot. And then after I moved to the US, I'd fly back uh, as often as I could and scuba dive in that same spot. And I noticed firsthand between 
1993 in 2003 how my favorite lush d densely uh, life-filled spot of ocean became this underground desolate plastic filled barren desert and it absolutely uh, broke my heart and woke me up out of this capitalist super that I was in where I finally understood that just this wealth accumulation exercise that I was on felt super futile on a planet that was dying. And starting 2003, I decided that if I'm going to invest in anything, if I was going to direct capital towards anything, it had to be something that allowed future generations to enjoy the planet that 10 years prior I was in love with, in awe of, and filled me up with kind of soulful, beautiful purpose. And that was the origination of my journey as an impact investor. And, you know, I mean, I can speak so much about the oceans, uh, but the their, my focus primarily is climate. So I'll get into that a little bit later. And obviously you spoke about COVID and one of the biggest gifts of COVID is it finally educated the world about the interconnectivity of everything. Like this notion that somehow there's a lane for health or there's a lane for the economy or there's a lane for climate or there's a lane um, for politics, there's a lane for oceans. This is, I mean, we no longer live in that reality. You know, there's somebody coughed one day in a uh, wet market in China and the whole world shut down. The inextricable connectivity of everything is now experienced by every human being on this planet. So for the first time, we, we all have to acknowledge that there is no separate lanes for everything. It's all one lane. We live in a closed sphere in the middle of space and the chemical balance on the planet is what allows it to sustain life. And this is the level that we've disrupted it where its life support system is now in danger, which of course is going to affect the economy for those of the people who separate economy from ecology. Of course, it's going to separate it. Of course, it's going to affect health for those people who think that health and climate are also not connected. So I'll stop there. I'll let my fellow uh, uh, panelists expand on that. But I just wanted to say that as tough as this year has been personally, professionally, planetarily, you know, the one gift that has come out of it is the, the, the whether not acknowledged or unacknowledged truth that we are all in this together. Fantastic. Fantastic. Um, Chris, uh, you know, award-winning filmmaker, one of the most powerful films I've ever watched, End of the Line. Um, you know, you're a tech star. You're in so many different areas. I, I kind of want to just get your overall take on, on the whole thing. I mean, does this stuff get you down? Does it get you blue? Does it, or does it make you hungry to, to keep fighting? I mean, you're, you're doing all this work. You're doing all this happy lifting. But you, have, you, you come at this from such a diverse angle, from so many different angles. You know, why, why are we failing the oceans? And, and, uh, and we'll get to the, my last question, you guys can think about a little bit, is going to be, you guys all get to a magic wand. You get to save the oceans by whatever year you want. That's going to be the last question. But, but for now, I just want to sort of get your take on why, why are we failing the oceans so miserably? Um, thanks for the kind introduction. I'm glad you watched the film. If anyone hasn't seen it, End of the Line, 10, 15 years on, still quite an important film to, to, to watch. Good to see you, David, Sylvia. Um, why, why, why is the ocean struggling so much? I think that, you know, in my uh, sort of 12 years of being involved in ocean conservation, nobody gave a shit because the ocean is out of sight and out of mind, you know, and from a philanthropic perspective, people care about dogs, old people and cancer, and they don't care about the ocean because most people are living in a big city and, you know, the ocean is vast, it's immense, it's plentiful, it's full of life, nothing to worry about. Um, fast forward 10 years, actually, the data is showing us that the ocean is in crisis. You know, 90% of large fish stocks are gone, more plastic in the ocean than fish, and 
the IPCC report that came out in September, which has told everybody, which I think that people in the ocean space knew is, if we don't solve the ocean crisis, we've got no chance of solving the climate crisis. They are completely linked. We know what the ocean does. Sylvia will, will tell us much more eloquently than I will. You know, it provides half the oxygen we breathe. It absorbs more than half the carbon we produce, and it feeds, you know, three billion people. It's the life source of the planet. So we must protect it. Um, am I pessimistic or optimistic? Is I think the question you asked. I'm, I'm optimistic because unlike the climate crisis, we know exactly what we need to do to solve the ocean crisis. You know, it's not complicated. We don't need more science. We don't need more information. We know the problem and we know what, we know how to fix it. We need to protect, fully protect at least 30% of it. And we need to make sure that 70% of it is sustainably managed and sustainably run. Uh, why may I be optimistic about it? Because, uh, one of the SDG targets to protect 10% by 2020, I am very confident we will get there. Uh, next month in November, I'm confident that there'll be a big announcement and we will hit our 10% by 2020. And I think that will give us a good headwind to feel that in the next decade, which is the decade of delivery for the global goals that we all know, that we will get to 30% by 2030. And we have to fucking do that because if we don't, we're all dead, right? So I feel tell us now, what's the announcement? You must know something. You said that like you know something. Really? Tell us what you, tell us what you know. Stop uh, holding back. Let yeah. the world know now. We haven't there, got there, time to wait. No, we haven't, but there will be two announcements. One where the, uh, Just uh, give uh, us one then. We're not being two, greedy. We don't need both of them. Two, Just give us one announcement. Two large marine reserves will, will, will be declared. Well, give us a clue. Like if, if someone wins, then they have to double down and pay more money to buy another reserve. Like start a competition. Maybe there's a little poll. <laughs> I'm confident. You're the only one with money. <laughs> <laughs> and one, of them, one of them will be in the British overseas territories and one of them will be in the French overseas territories. Oh, look at that. Um, there you go. You heard it here first. So, that, so that's pretty good news. And I, and, and I think that there's progress in the high seas. Obviously, territorial water is easier to protect than high seas. And there's a lot of work going on with the Treaty of the High Seas. So I think that, coupled with now, finally, there is interest from capital markets and investors in the blue economy. So... There hasn't been an interest in what is a three trillion dollar economy. There now is kind of the the, 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 the the technology advancements and the necessary disruption that is going to improve the in existing industrial footprint. It's going to enable it to be more sustainable, better managed, and produce uh, more sustainable gains for the ocean at the same time producing economic economic gains for investors. So we will see a huge influx of capital into 71% of the planet. And I believe that that money will help improve the ocean health and give investors positive returns. And once we start seeing that, we will then start to see an increase in ocean health. So I'm confident there'll be more money from philanthropy and there'll be more money from investors. And we need that money to improve uh, the ocean health. Chris, I can uh, feel this dark cloud lifting off my head just hearing you speak. Maybe you can read me a bedtime story every night. That's uh. I was I'm, an, I'm an ancient optimist. Yeah, I love that. That's amazing. Um, Dr. Sylvia Earl, I mean, uh, I'm like, you know, I'm fanboying like everybody else who gets to meet you. You know, I've known you for a long time. Um, and I think that you, through your, your uh, I'll call it your celebrity, but the whole world's in love with you. And I think by being in love with you, they're in love with the oceans. You are this, you're the one person I know out there who's breaking down the walls of apathy, perhaps better than anybody when it comes to the big blue. And, um, you know, I, you've been at it for so long with the oceans, uh, fighting for the oceans, speaking about the oceans. Um, why are they still underfunded? Why are they still underrepresented? And are you optimistic um, that we can get there? Well, why people don't care about the ocean, Paul, is pretty simple. Because we're terrestrial. <laughs> it's the great mystery of the sea, actually. Because... Now we know in the 21st century what could not be known any time in the past. When I was a child, no one had been up in the sky to look back on Earth, to see Earth as something really special in a universe of really unfriendly places. I mean, I applaud those who want to go to Mars. I say, go for it. 
I have my list. Take them with you. Um, but I'll, I think we really need to make peace with, with Earth. Peace on Earth, but peace with Earth. And it's mostly blue. At least the part that keeps us alive. I really struggle with trying to understand. Because I'm in the company of those who do get it. That to realize that the ocean is vital to make the planet habitable. We treat it as if it's infinite. What we take out, what we put in. And I, I totally agree with the perspective that you know, our highest priority has to be to take care of, of our life support system. I am not all that excited about what people are referring to as the blue economy, putting gazillions of dollars into the sea. This is if they finally discovered that there are things out there we haven't yet captured and minerals we haven't yet extracted. Now that we can get to the deep sea, let's go. I mean, I'm worried about the scaling up of fishing operations to go to places that have not yet been accessed, most particularly the deep scattering layer, that up and down migration that occupies so much of the carbon cycle on the planet that has been neglected because most people don't even know about it. I mean, you don't see it every day. In fact, it's hard to see it looking at a sonar screen, or if you're lucky enough, and I'm one of the lucky, lucky ones, you go down in the submarines, a thousand meters, or even a hundred meters, because it's within that space. But that's deeper than drivers go, these folks drivers. And so it's, it's not knowing that leads to not caring. But that could be an excuse, I would say, in the 20th century, Less and less is of an excuse in the 21st. The evidence is there. The evidence is there about not how does the climate affect the ocean, but how does the ocean affect the climate? The ocean drives the climate. It distributes temperature around the planet. No ocean, no climate. <laughs> no ocean, no ours. No blue, no green is my favorite. Or something about. And I think we have inherited habits. We've come along through all of human history, taken from nature. From the land, we can see the consequences of clear cutting forests, losing species left, right, and all over the place. I mean, we did to the land and animals on the land. Over 10,000 years, it was taking us about half a century to, to do the same thing much faster. That is, to take the practice of life, the diversity of life, the abundance of life, and concern it. I mean, we're way out of control when it comes to fishing. We, we talk about wildlife trade because we can see a decline in elephants and giraffes and birds and trees and all that, but we can't see as readily the decline of what we've taken from the ocean. And the line does a great job of Great. But, you know, we're, we're at a point now where a lot of individual species, whole populations, whole ecosystems are right on the edge. Half the coral reefs basically gone. The, the big populations of tuna that are important to the carbon cycle. You know, I went to the World Economic Forum earlier this year. I was so excited because I whale, whales are making headlines as carbon-based units. I mean, I go back a hundred years, where whales would make headlines because of pounds of meat, but whales of oil. Um, but to realize that the economists we're putting a price tag, a carbon tag, price tag on whales. Their role in maintaining carbon in the ocean over their long life <clears throat> and then ultimately sequestering that carbon <clears throat> into the great depths below where it cycles over 
long time period, so we're talking thousands, ten thousands of years, once the carbon gets to the bottom of the ocean. Okay, so you can make a case for not killing whales because they're valuable, alive. So why don't we make a case for tuna? They're valuable, alive. We give them an accounting base of zero. That's why it's probably important to catch them. We, and cod, and swordfish, and krill from Antarctica, it's like um, thousand year old trees. We don't pay for the cost. It's got a zero accounting base for wildlife in the ocean. And Paul, oh, you know, ocean life is wildlife. <laughs> it is. It's the biggest it wildlife, wildlife trade on the planet. We're all, and we should be, CITES, yeah. we should be really upset about trade and endangered species. Well, when North Carolina gets down to under 3%, of the population, adult population, of course, a little bit. It takes a long time to get to be big ones, like 10 years, and most of them get eaten along the way. So, mm. if a papa tuna and a papa tuna can make, replace themselves, they've done their job. All the little, most of them, of their offspring, go into the carbon cycle, the nitrogen cycle, the oxygen cycle, the chemistry of the ocean. And it's true of most of life in the ocean. Yeah. I mean, they're in danger, but because we have developed a habit using fish for money. I, I, I take issue with the claim that three billion people, you did not say rely on the ocean for food. You said that they consume, you know, it seems like you say, it's half the world's population, or sometimes it's 20% or whatever it is. But whatever it is, it's mostly a choice, except for some populations, the same sorts of individuals who rely on bushmeat on the land. There's some who really don't have many choices. For mo most of what is taken from the sea is not a matter of food security, it's a matter of carbon security, it's a matter of yeah. security. It's a matter of biodiversity security. It's a matter of holding the planet steady with all the pieces that make it function. I can excuse those, even in the middle of the 20th century, who in not, not realizing that you could take too many fish from the sea. You could shake up Antarctica by extracting large quantities of fish. You could shake the whole system. Yeah. But we're still doing it. Even yeah. though we know. But I don't I have an answer to your question, Paul. I'm just hook it. Maybe. <laughs> well, that's okay. That's okay, Sylvia. I want you to sit there and dream now because I'm going to give you a magic wand. You get to save the ocean all by yourself by the end of this call. But right now, our new friend, David Rothschild, is all fired up. And um, Go for David, it. you know, again, the oceans are underfunded. I, I want to ask you. If the oceans are underfunded, and we've just heard Sylvia and everybody else talk about that basically no blue, no us, no earth, we're all going to die if we can't take over our oceans. Yet, they're, they're the most underfunded of the sustainable development goals. Where does the money go? I don't, you know, where, where is all this money going if, if the heart of our planet is underfunded? I really, I want to understand that. You're, you're one of the great explorers out there. You're also one of the most generous philanthropists out there for our oceans. You're also probably one of the most soulful and passionate people I know for our ocean. So, you know, you care about the stuff. You're in it. You live it. You see it. Why are we not putting money into it? And where is that money going in philanthropy? Steven Seagal. Not Steven Seagal. <laughs> I was going to say Steven Seagal and um, Steven Spielberg, rather. Or Steven Seagal. He always gets it. He's just a chef. Remember that film? Um, so, yeah, it's Steven Spielberg. I kind of blame him a little bit. And um, I know I shouldn't because he's a really nice guy, probably. But Jaws, right? Um, Sweet. It made, yeah, it made everybody afraid of the ocean, right? Mm -hmm. I don't know a single person who isn't afraid of the ocean. And I see this often, right? Apart from, yeah. obviously, it's incredible people. But the majority of people are afraid of the ocean. I think Chris said it. It's out of sight, out of mind. And so we are living with a slightly outdated brain model when it comes to all environmental issues, right? We're more afraid of being eaten by a shark than we are losing the species. We're more afraid of camping in the woods in darkness than we are losing the trees. So in our minds, right, even though 
we think, you know, that we're more likely to choke on a peanut or a coconut falls on our head, or there's something, some, there's something like 30 idiots around the United States every year who have a vending machine call on them because they're trying to reach candy that they haven't paid for. I mean, like, they probably deserve to die. Sorry, guys. But, you know, the, you know, the chance of getting eaten by a shark is so slim, but we're petrified. And then if we do go to the ocean, we're probably sitting there with a cocktail on our hand on a lilo, an inflatable thing, just chilling, going, the ocean looks great. What's the problem? And so we don't connect. And so you're right. It is underfunded. It is out of sight. It, all the things that have just been said, it's exploited. And I, I guess I'm a sort of a, I'm an optimistic pessimist. They said it the other day. There was a quote. I can't remember who said it, but winning slowly is still losing. And we're losing. We're losing the conversation. We're losing the battle. We're not getting the funds. There's a huge funding gap, right? I mean, in the trillions of dollars. Every year, the IMF basically put out a document that says the oil and gas industry is getting roughly $3 trillion worth of subsidies, right? Can we just take that and put it into the ocean? Why not take the overfishing right? overfishing subsidy? Exactly. $20 right? so, billion a year. To so what does this tell you? Industry. As soon as you get into a position of power, common sense seems to go out the window, right? I've seen it. We've seen it. You posture. You get into a position of power, and then you pay lip service, and you make these massive statements that say we're going to protect something, you know, in 30 years. And I hate to say this, but, like, you know, we had the Millennium Development Goals, which came to fruition this year. And guess what? We didn't achieve a lot of them, so we called them the Sustainable Development Goals, and we pushed it out by 10 years. Let's okay. act today. Okay. Let's do what we can today, right? Like, Sylvia... How, I mean, like, you couldn't be clearer. Like, you, you know, you are the, you've been this advocate. So have you, Paul, with your imagery. So is everybody on this call. Like, it, it's, it's like, why is humanity not listening? And it's not just the ocean, but the ocean is the most vital. It's the heartbeat. I always say, if you look at the human body, you think of the ocean as the cardiovascular system, right? The blue and, heart. And that's what it is. It's the blue heart. And so if we kill the ocean, we kill ourselves and it's dying. And there's no simple way to put it, right? We, we have to look at everything and anything. And I kind of get to the point where I go, the bad guys keep on winning. Why do they win? Because they just get on with doing the things that they shouldn't be doing. And we sort of sit around sometimes, not ourselves, we, but we're like, we're too polite. We almost need an army for nature. Mm -hmm. I, I'm, I'm encouraging people who are watching to rise up, grab like a Dunkirk invasion, oh, right? Yeah, like whoever, like anybody, like get out there. And, and your weapon might be a camera like you, Paul, or your weapon mm -hmm. might be your voice like you, Sylvia, or your weapon might be your investing, or your weapon might just be telling your, you know, your family, we're not going to eat fish anymore, right? So we all have capacity. We all have capacity. So I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm optimistic, but I'm also highly pessimistic, and maybe it's just not our time to be on this planet for much longer. But I, I have a daughter now. So I want to focus on what the world would look like for her. So I'm going to keep it positive. Right. I'm going to keep it positive because it's like way too early it. to have a drink. Yes. Okay. I, I want to I quickly pass this to Christina because she often tells me this and it sort of slaps me in the face when, when she breaks down, you know, when, she, when I see her on stage doing her talks, you know, and I, and I'm like, really, it can't be, it can't be. But when Christina explains to me where the philanthropic, philanthropic dollars go. Um, so go ahead and take it away. Christina. Well, I, I want to take it back to a couple of things. And, and first of all, thank you so much, Chris and Ibrahim, because I believe that in order to articulate the future, we have to think about it in a very optimistic and positive way. Uh, Martin Luther King didn't start by saying, I have a nightmare. So painting out what the dream is is really important. And I come from this for 30 years of doing conservation and realizing that not enough people give a shit, like you said, uh, David. And I'm a very practical person, so I started thinking, you know, how do we get more people in the door? I realized working for Conservation International that we were going at this from a very cerebral, scientific uh, angle to bring people in, you know, with the data and the graphs and the statistics. And most people don't feel equipped enough or they don't have enough of a background. Nobody wants to feel stupid, so it's easier to reject it. So we thought, you know what, maybe through photography, which is lowering the bar, really lowering the price of entry. And that's what we did. You know, we just started posting photographs and pictures and opening the door wider for people to say, hell, yeah, you know, that's beautiful. I want to know more. And it's kind of worked. And then we wanted to do one more thing. You know, it's great to have more eyeballs on the issue and we have a long way to go. How do you turn those people into investors for the ocean? So that it's not just the Ibrahims of the world, but it's your children, my children, 
for putting in a little bit of skin in the game. And so that's kind of what we've been focusing on because for me, the big realization that SDG 14 is the most underfunded was like, how can that even be possible? But hearing you talk the other day, David, about where philanthropy money goes to, and you were explaining, and maybe you want to um, remind us of, of where it goes to, uh, David. This yeah, I mean, I was just saying there's about 400, I mean, looking at the US, because it's probably one of the most sophisticated markets when it comes to fundraising for causes and philanthropy. And, you know, you won, actually, you <laughs> you won the competition when I asked how much is raised, and it, it fluctuates, and I'm sure she had dropped, but let's call it 400 20 billion dollars or 450 billion dollars are going into philanthropy and and still today every year in the US every yeah. year in the US 29 to 30 percent of that is going to religion still a because it's a tax write-off for a lot of people and there's no upper limit right mm. but I keep on wondering like you know and I said this the other day to someone I said look don't take this the wrong way but I've never seen God you know what I mean but I've seen nature everywhere yeah. right and we've played on this uncertainty, right? Religion has played on uncertainty, which says at the end of our life, we might go somewhere which we don't like, right? We might go to hell, so pay up now. Mm -hmm. And we've taken this uncertainty and used it to our, very effectively. I'll tell you something that is certain, that if we continue to put money into things that aren't inside of the realm, what I call natural systems, then we'll certainly go somewhere that we don't want to go. But I think it's amazing. And if you look at the spectrum of where the investment is going, yeah. only 3% is going to the environment, right? And 5%, and I love the arts, but 5% is going to arts and culture. So we're mm. putting more into beautiful, you know, images and beautiful mm. paintings of nature mm. than we are actually protecting nature. So yeah. that tells us something. And I think so that's, a pyramid that's like this, and we need to flip it. We need yeah, to flip that exactly. pyramid. So, you know, we're actually powering through time. We can do this all day long. Um, but that's we're great. We're going to create a religion. Can I just build on it? we say we're going to create a religion of nature? So that's yeah. something yeah, that's right there. We're going to create Chris, the, you go ahead and build on that, and then I'm going to give you guys your yeah. magic wand. I just wanted to say, in terms of an ROI, protecting the oceans is the best return you're going to get, right? Because it is pretty cost-effective. Creating an MPA does not cost a lot of money, right? So... Some of the biggest marine reserves in the world have been set up for millions of dollars and single digit millions of dollars, not billions of dollars. And these are large areas of the ocean where, you know, fish are coming back to life and biodiversity is being protected, coral is replenishing. And if we invest in oceans and we protect mangroves, we rewild the sea, we bring kelp back, we bring seaweed back, we create these marine protected areas, the ocean has an amazing propensity to recover. And it doesn't cost a lot of money. And to protect 30% of the world's ocean, you know, a couple of billion dollars would go a huge way in doing that. And that's nothing in today's finance to protect 30% of the planet. You know, I'm going to say something that gives perspective to our audience who are watching this quick statement, Paul. Sorry. You know, just like our human bodies are made up of three quarters of water, our entire planet's surface is over 70% ocean okay mm. so over 70% of our planet's surface is ocean not from less than 1% of non-profit funding just less than 1% is going to ocean conservation so you see the disparity and you see it, it just makes zero sense and you know whatever it has to do with and and, and actually Chris our good friend Julie is, is um, writing a note she said she says that I really think that it would make a big difference if ocean conservation was taught school and became a part of the UN education project. And so yeah. I lack of that. Ocean school. Yeah, ocean. That's that's great. So Abraham, I, I'm gonna make you my first Martin Luther King that you have a dream and, and, and let's just say it's to save the oceans and I wanna know what your magic wand is. I mean I someone did that exercise me with a couple months ago and it was so cathartic to be able to dream and envision a world where we actually save this stuff and protect it and you know, you have anybody, you have a path forward. I know you, we talked earlier and I would love to hear sort of your journey, how we're going to get there. So my, my dream is a world that works for everyone and everything. And, you know, that's just to set that, set that straight. So the, you know, where, where nothing is a zero sum game in order for, you know, one thing to thrive, some other has to fail or collapse. So um, my, I don't remember what, uh, what you said, David, was it, you know, my tool, my weapon 
uh, is the private sector. And not, it's not because that's the best tool. It's just the tool that I know. I'm not, I'm not part of the NGO community. I am not, you know, my wife and I have a foundation. I'll speak about that in a second. You know, I'm not part of government. And I acknowledge that, you know, for governments coming together to put a carbon tax uh, on carbon emissions is the biggest tool in the world that's going to, uh, the biggest lever in the world for balancing uh, this planet. And that has to happen and that has to happen ASAP because that will move all the capital markets, all the trillions that you mentioned towards a low carbon economy. And as Sylvia knows and the rest of you know, 97% of the sun's rays get born by the oceans. So, you know, we if it wasn't for the oceans, we would have been cooked a long time ago. Most of that heat, 97% of it is absorbed by the oceans. So let's put that aside and I'll talk about, you know, the private sector for a little bit. So there's this new, you know, this new term that I'm sure everybody on this call uh, has heard called impact investing. And that's a spectrum. You know, there's a spectrum that's completely ridiculous where you just jump on a trend and call anything impact investing. I've been pitched uh, tear gas canisters as an impact investment because they're better than rubber bullets. You know, there's a there's people who call Jewel an impact investment because it helps people quit smoking. You know, let's set all of that stuff aside and let's go. Let's start the spectrum at. Um, uh, something called negative screening. And um, negative screening means that you tell your advisor, hey, I don't want to be in fossil fuels, private prisons, tobacco, alcohol, firearms, etc., but I can be into anything else. So I attest that anything else is going to put you in mostly technology these days. And technology serves us in many ways, but even now is contributing to the destruction of our civilization. I mean, our entire discourse, the notion of truth itself is evaporating because all these technology companies have developed algorithms that are only designed to get you to click to buy more crap you don't need. And it's time to add Facebook, Twitter, Google, and all of these platforms into the divest movement until they reform. So that's one end of the spectrum if that's all you end up doing. Because remember, philanthropy is a massive tool, but most foundations only give away 5% of their proceeds by law per year. But guess what happens with the 95%? It continues to get reinvested. So if we use the 95% to save the world, we're using the, the pile that's currently actually causing the destruction, and we're using it to start doing good. So... The spectrum, negative screening, after negative screening is this new term called ESG metrics. So what that is, is environment, sustainability, governance metrics, which are very important for corporations to use. But in my world, investing in companies that have uh, uh, adhere to some form of ESG metrics is fine, but understand that all that is is doing less harm. So right. these corporations create Widget X. Widget X used to produce this much damage. Now they adhere to ESG metrics, so it produces this much damage. So if, yeah. if, you're, if you're in a house that's on fire, downgrading from a flamethrower to a blowtorch is, I attest, is not that helpful. Can I, can I just, sorry, I just, ESG is like corporate social responsibility. It doesn't mean anything. It's not enough. It's not doing enough good. And for the oceans and environment, we have to have much more stringent frameworks about how the money is going to improve the health of the planet. Yeah, I'm not promoting ESG, or I'm just going through the spectrum so people understand okay. it when they talk to their financial advisors or decide what they want to do with their invested capital so we can mobilize the trillions that you're talking about. So you okay. know, then we have, and if I'm yeah, taking too much time... I just want to give uh, Dr. Earl a time to wrap up because I know she is going to save the planet. And Chris is saying something as well. So I just want to make sure we're about to run out of time in about four and a half minutes. So you each have sort of one minute to save the planet. Can I just kick this over to Sylvia? Just go. Sorry, Chris, finish your comment. I mean, if it's okay. Dr. Earl, sorry, can you turn up your volume, please? All right. 
All right, I'll jump in. Time's a waste me. Impact investing is great, but the return that we should expect might be the return we get for our kids and our grandkids. It should be the long haul that we are looking for the return. Investment in the ocean right now is a big worry because it's like deep sea mining with whatever excuse you want to flip on it. However, green, you might want to paint it. That's definitely not green. <laughs> yeah. That's, or, that's, def that's, that's definitely that's not what we're talking about or what we want to do. I, yeah. Let's go out and get those underutilized species. Back in the 80s, it was sharks were underutilized. So let's go get them. And now 90% of them are gone. Mm. I mean, it's like, let's think differently about what we want in return. It impact philanthropy, where you don't, you know, you don't care about putting it back in the bank right away. You're going to get it back, or your children will get it back. We need to keep this current crisis, that is the planetary meltdown, as something as riveting as what we're going through right now with the pandemic. And maybe the pandemic is caused for hope in that, look, overnight, what well, a few months, we really did change in ways that we could not have imagined this time last year. What? The world would shut down, basically, because of concern about our health? What about concern about the health of the planet? If people could see what we see, if they could know what we know. I attended a, a security conference where, like the general, all strangled with brave and whatever. He said, what we really need for planetary security there's an education bomb I made mean, from a journal that would be just right. You know? But literally, let's get people to understand why it matters. That's the key. If you don't know, you can't care. We need a good marketer for the ocean, yeah. a good marketer for the planet, a good marketer for life on Earth. Ours is very much in the balance. Yeah, great. Chris, I want to give let you finish. That's great, Sylvia. Thank you. I mean, it's, oh God, I wish we could do this for yeah. hours. Uh, let's just all get on a boat someday and go talk and solve all this. Chris, uh, I'd let's like that, too. Let's get on the boat. Yeah, both of you. Chris, I, you have a thought you didn't finish. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, just, but did you want, want me to finish on Magic Wand, or? Yeah, Matt, whatever, uh, whatever you that's got. That's inspiring. Knock I, I just mark. failed. On the, on the impact investing quickly, Sylvia, I totally, I hear you, but there's so many companies now that are focusing on ocean health. So whether that is trying to restore and plant seaweed or mangroves at scale to rewild the ocean, to sequester carbon, there's great AI and technologies that are looking at making fishing efficient so there's no bycatch. The data is really accurate. There's sustainable aquaculture on shore. So they're, they're not using wild fish to feed farm fish. So cutting down all of that ridiculous supply chain, which is destroying wild fisheries. So there's some good stuff and we need to build on the good stuff. I it's agree. And I, wish, I wish people were more generous with charitable and philanthropic money, but unfortunately they're not. They just won't. They want to, they want to have a return. If we can do both, I think we can make a big difference. In terms of my magic wand, number one, We've got to stop subsidies for IUU, illegal, unregulated, unreported fishing. It's a fucking joke, right? $30 billion of government money is funding pirates that are going around stealing, destroying fish, taking it away from the poorest communities in the world, dredging the ocean, destroying everything. It's got to stop, number one, right? Number two, every country has to agree to protect 30% of their territorial waters. They every have to do that. It's easy. It's in their rights to do that. We need to be more aggressive with illegal fishing in waters. And then we need a treaty to protect the high seas. 60% oh. of the ocean is a free-for-all. We've got to get the UN together, and we've got to agree we're going to protect the high seas. We do those three things, we're going to move the needle, and we're going to make a big difference. I like that. Fantastic. David you, David, you came into this phone call fired up, and I want you to leave fired up. You look too calm. So... <laughs> I want you to save it. You're, you're, you're muted. That's not working. You're muted, David. <laughs> I'm muted. I'm right. muted. I'm, I'm unmuted now. I'm back. I'm back in the room. No, I mean, you listen. Got one minute I, to save it all. 
I'm 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 following you guys. Stand on the shoulders of giants and incredible people. All of you guys on this panel are doing incredible things, and I I want to officially say it now. I've gone from being a, an optimistic pessimist to an optimist again. So thank you for lighting another candle and making some headway and giving me some inspiration to think about the planet. Now, for me, I guess my magic wand is for a long time I've been thinking about the idea of like you know, and I you know, just keep on thinking that. Why have we not yet got a seat for nature inside of the United Nations? Right? There's a seat there for the Vatican. There's a seat there for you know the Holy City for God, but there isn't a seat for nature. So it's about time that maybe we re revisit the World Charter for Nature that was actually passed in 1982 that had some of the most eloquent, articulate narratives around the relationship and the responsibility of humans to the natural environment, including protecting our high seas. Right? This was in 1982. So I would offer. The very simple solution is saying we need the United Nations of nature. We take all the indigenous lands and the indigenous voice, the original custodians of nature. We elevate them. We stop just keeping them in the wings. We bring them in. I'm sorry to say we don't have that voice on this panel, but we need voices to come in and bring in the indigenous elder voice, the wisdom voice, the wisdom tradition. We need to respect nature, listen to nature, and we need to create a structure that says nature has a seat. It is at the table. Not on the table, right? Whatever way that is, we need to do that. So that would be my magic wand: creating the United Nations nature, looking at the legal rights of nature. Nature needs the same rights that we are afforded, and that is, you know, something for us to think about. Yeah. Give nature a voice. Yeah. Beautiful, David. Chris is going to say something. I was just going to say that the economy is a wholly owned subsidiary of nature, right? Which nature is the most valuable, valuable resource, the most valuable technology platform we have. And we have to help replenish it and help rewild it. You know, we, there's a lot of talk about rewilding. Rewild the sea, bring it back to life. Protect the mangroves, the kelp, the seaweed, and the fish. Let's do that. Let's focus on that. If we destroy nature, we're all dead. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And guy, I just want to say, you know, thank you for putting us all together. We got really excited when we saw lists of names. You, I like, but I, you know, I get pretty blue sometimes. I get pretty down. I mean, you you do feel this anxiety for our planet as you see the news and you see the leadership and you you get pretty demoralized. And so to say, you know, to have a group of all, you know, all of us here today, eight of us sitting here, I think it just gives you that injection of energy to keep you in the fight. So there's seven of us, but yes. Okay, sorry. Thanks, <laughs> for helping me count. But um, anyhow, I I really really appreciate it. Um, Gaia, do you have any last words before we say goodbye? I just wanted to say that this is, you know, this is just the beginning of us uniting together our, our network, our resources, our intelligence, our passion, our dedication. And that's what it takes. I know all of you echo that, that, you know, we have these great minds who work in their own silos within their city, their country, and their continent. Bringing it together is what's going to make a difference. And it's starting here right now with this panel. And um, and we're going to continue that. You guys are, you know, this is incredible. We all know each other. We have a history together. So so onward we go, and whatever we can do to save um, to save this very very important conservation that doesn't cost mo much money is, I think, an incredible and inspiring work. And look forward to that. And I want to thank you guys again. I really appreciate it. So great to thank see you, everyone. Thank you. I really appreciate. It. Thank Bye. you. Thank you.